dia sengit. Ha. Dia macam ni. Kalau dekat handphone okey lah. Tapi kalau dekat laptop dia macam ni. Oh, the phone is alright. It's, it's, it's oh, good okay. but in laptop is still Sekejap kat cuba refresh. Okay, dia kalau refresh okey. Phone okey lah phone. Okey. Okey. Okay, let's have a seat. Let's go. Coffee talk. Okay, please have a seat. Please have a chair. You can take any chair. Sorry, we didn't prepare the chair. Do you think the aircon is on? Ah, I. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, just on. Just on lah. Yeah, Mr. Ben, switch us off and then. Switch us off. Okay, so everyone is here. Okay, good. Okay, so first of all, uh, I want to say good. I want to say thank you for coming for today coffee talk session. So today is like our eighth session of our coffee talk program. Okay. So Dr. Yun has uh, give a lecture, right? Uh, I already. This is your second time, right? For the coffee talk session. So without wasting our time, I would like to invite Dr. Yun to okay. lead this program. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are not going to have a lecture. It's just a <coughs> common discussions, just to arouse your curiosity. I I have a lot of things to talk about. So we can talk about physics per se, but that could be quite boring. Then I actually want to make the physics to be relevant to you. Because as a student, you would learn physics in your class then if you just learn physics as in the textbook as like it is a uh, knowledge that has nothing to do with you then you would find the studying to be very boring but physics that you learned in the textbook is very, very much related and relevant to, to the real life so hopefully by engaging in this kind of discussions uh, you can make a link between what you study in your class and what is actually happening in the real world. So I think that's very important or else you look at your textbook, you know, your, your, your 104 textbook. It's just a textbook that is to be memorized uh, so you go in and score. But it's other than that, it has no, um, no any meaning that is actually a waste. So what you learn in the undergraduates is actually very, very much relevant because you will learn all these basic, uh, basic foundations of physics in your first year and second year. Uh, if you have no strong foundations in this physics knowledge, then when you go to the next level, you will not be able to appreciate and comprehend the physics used in research. 
Okay, so we are going to talk about special, uh, talk about relativity in general. Okay, so most of you in these uh, schools, you learn special relativity in 104. Uh, 104 is in the second semester. Yes. Now, uh, so any first year students here? Oh, <laughs> also many. Okay, so you learn your, Dr. Yam is teaching 104. One. Who else is teaching? Dr. Ramzun and Dr. Sohana. Okay, so I do not know what they teach, uh, but you should you should make relevant between the 104 that you learn and the real physics out there. Uh, so I'll try to make the link between 104 and special relativity for you. So do you so you are now uh, learning special relativity in your first two few lectures, right? Yeah. First chapter. First chapter. Okay. Um, so let me first talk about 104. 104 is modern physics. Uh, so in 104, you have a small part, I think one quarter of the syllabus in 104 is special relativity. And then three quarter are something else. Uh, so why is it called modern physics? So your Dr. Yam tell, did Dr. Yam tell you why it's called modern physics? So, Dr. Sohana? Classical is not working at all. Classical is not working, yeah. It breaks, breaks down when the velocity approaches uh, the speed of light. Well, yeah. So, when you talk about modern physics, then it's actually to be contrasted with classical physics. So, classical physics, uh, normally it means physics that is not special relativistic as well as it's uh, not quantum. So, like say, thermodynamics, uh, electromagnetism, and classical physics, uh, classical mechanics, they are all classical physics. And normal, normally in modern physics, you talk about quantum mechanics and special relativity. Uh, in a sense, special relativity is not modern. It's actually part of an extension of a classical physics. It's just a best uh, jet. It's just a classical physics, and you, you generalize to high speed. So when you talk about modern, you talk about, normally you refer to quantum. So basically people divide, well, last time when I teach 104, you divide the world into four quadrant, four quadrant. So the quadrant is like, you break things down into four parts. Um, that is the x-axis is, I think is the, is the, uh, is the scale, energy scale. And the y-axis is the, is the size, energy scales and size, energy scales and size. So when size is large and energy is low, so we are talking about classical physics regime. So all the physics, most of the physics that you learn throughout uh, your undergraduates are belonging to this classical regime. So that's when size is large, energy is low. Then you could have a case where energy is low, but size is small. So that is quantum regime. That is in quantum mechanics, uh, like molecules, atoms, nucleus. No, not nucleus, atoms. Then you can have a case where the what energy is high, uh, size is small. Uh, size is large. Size is large. Energy is large. That is the case of uh, general uh, relativity. So relativity deals with uh, systems uh, where the size is very large and the energy is very high. Okay. Um, and then you have another extreme case is that you have extremely small scale, energy extremely high. So that belongs to, to what? Uh? That belongs to quantum gravity. Okay. Something which you need quantum gravity, you need quantum mechanics, you also need relativity, general relativity. So in this case, we use energy to differentiate the systems. We do not use velocity. Okay. So like Dr. Yang would say, when energy, when the velocity is very high, goes to the scale of light, you use relativity. When speed is small, you use classical physics. Uh, but here we say this, when energy is very high, then we use uh, relativity. When energy is small, then we use classical physics. Okay. So most of the time, when you open up your eye as a toddler come out, coming out from your mother's womb, 
you you are actually born in the classical world in the sense that the world that you deal with using uh, that you contact with your eye your senses and even some machines your or normal machines like the lenses um, the telescopes uh, it only allows you to see the classical world where the size of the world is roughly larger slightly larger than uh, the, the length of a hair the largest one would be you know like uh, the earth size or the size between the earth and the moon the size between the earth and the sun so these are classical scale uh, so all these regions they are ruled by the classical physics and we do not only really actually go into other quadrants using our own senses like you never see atoms uh, or electrons in fact you never go to very high speed of course you never go near to the black holes where energy is extremely high and the uh, size is extremely large so these are the pattern that very remote from our web our normal experience therefore the whole physics actually started from classical physics because this is the most natural uh, frontier that the people human sense human sense come into contact with okay. so you always learn about classical physics because it's just closest to your intuitions um, but in the turn of the century uh, people start to think what happens when the speed of a moving object is approaching speed of light uh, so the one very straightforward uh, intuition is that everything would be still the same as like classical physics when speed is getting close to the speed of light uh, the, all the laws of physics would still be the same it's just it's just energy is become larger and one very important consequence well one very important intuition intuition means that uh, the feeling that you think should be correct but actually it's just a extension of your feeling it's not really uh, a, a, a effect that is proven by experiments for example uh, you will think that uh, when you run fast, you have two objects that is running, then you can always uh, move, run faster than the other one. So there is always this relative speed between two moving objects. So sometimes you can run past and you can run slower. So imagine you can always run fast and there is no limit to how fast you can run. That is a direct uh, feeling that people would think if you were living in the say 19th century before the uh, discovery of, of relativity so you think that you run fast you run fast you run fast and at some time you run faster than speed of light and it's possible to run faster than speed of light based on your intuitions right uh, but then this guy Einstein he sit down and think uh, what is the consequence if somehow you can go faster than speed of light so I think if you still have your 104 notes, I think I, I have a picture uh, showing a person looking in the mirror. In a, do you have it? Uh, a, a person looking in the mirror in a rocket. And the rocket is approaching the speed of light and <laughs> reach the speed of light. So that was the question Einstein was thinking. What happens if you surf along with light? Surf along with light means that light is going in this direction. You are also moving along with the same direction of light. So it's like you are in a rocket, you look in the mirror, then the, the rocket is moving at the speed of light. Now what happened then? Do you see any image, image in yeah. the mirror? You are moving classically. <laughs> yeah. uh, so before the discovery of relativity, imagine you, are, you were Einstein. Uh, so Einstein was trying to figure out what happened then, and then try to figure out what is the consequence if that kind of scenario occurs so by that time people have no special direct relativity to explain what happens but you can use your pure imaginations and the pure logical deductions to deduce the consequence of this kind of thought experiment so Einstein he was very uh, credited for inventing this uh, so-called Gedanken experiments I think I'm talking about Gedanken experiments good so Gedanken is a German word means uh, it's an experiment that is done by thinking but the thinking experiment you don't need to carry it out but it must follow uh, logics 
So all the consequences can be imagined and deduced based on this imagination alone. So if you look at the mirror, you see the image in the mirror because light gets reflected from the mirror. Yeah. But if you are moving in a, in a rocket where they move along the speed of light, and if light obey the law of Galilean transformations, Galilean transformation is a classical understanding that you can have a velocity, one velocity two, and there's this relative velocity. That's always possible that the one V can go faster than the other V. It always can overtake the other V or become smaller than the other V. So this is what we always used to. So imagine the light is one of the velocity, and it's just a velocity that's moving fast, and I could approach, uh, move faster and faster, so that I get closer and closer to the speed of light, and even surplus the velocity of light. So that kind of extensions, that's kind of uh, things, it's a very natural extension from our daily experience. Uh, so this kind of velocity, relative velocity, is what we call Galilean transformations. Right? So we assume uh, Galilean transformations can also be applied to light. So, so um, if you are moving in a rocket and uh, you have a lit light coming out from your face and it's moving towards the, uh, the mirror and coming back. So at certain directions, the speed of light uh, would go in these directions and the rocket is also moving in that direction. So if you think about it, light will actually never travel and become still. So there wouldn't be any light reflecting, you wouldn't see anything into the mirror. Right. So that was a, the beginning point of Einstein to start to think, is this possible? And what is the consequence of that? So if you think about it more carefully, you don't need to be Einstein, but you can actually go along the thinking line as Einstein did. The, the consequence of take, overtaking light actually could lead to logical fallacy, logical inconsistency. Uh, that is, you will actually be able to see things before it happens. So that is one of the consequences if you can overtake light. <laughs> can you imagine why is that when you overtake light, you can see light in the future? You can imagine that, uh, like, we are now sitting here, we are talking, like, so when I'm talking, I'm creating events. The events that is happening now is giving off light at this moment of time. Mm -hmm. So the light that is reflecting from my, from me, or from this event, is radiating out in all directions, and it formerly called a sphere. Yeah, there's a name for that, it's a light sphere. So the light sphere that is coming up at this moment uh, would like, form a bubble that is moving and expanding at the speed of light. So this surface of the bubble contains all the information that's happening at this moment when I'm speaking. So, so this bubble is expanding. So imagine that uh, there would be, there are some events that happened before this. So the bubbles, light bubble, that happened before this, maybe like say three minutes ago, uh, before we begin this talk, um, that time also you emit a light bubble. So that means the light bubble actually happening somewhere further away from the light bubble that's emitted from here. So the light bubbles that emits contain information of the past. Uh, so if you can overpass, uh, go through and go faster and faster, you'll be able to catch up all the bubbles that is happening before that. Uh, yes, sir. Makes sense. Then, yeah, makes sense. Okay. Makes sense. So anyway, when you can go past the speed of light, it, it will lead to a lot of logical consequences that is uh, that would be not possible. So basically, if you go through the speed of light and then uh, it will lead to many logical inconsistency for our physical world. So somehow the universe have to have a way to censor such a possibility. If it exists the possibility of going back into the future or going back in the past, that would lead to many uh, logical inconsistency. La. Like you can go back to the past and you kill your parents, father. Uh, kill your father then you will not be able to bond to this world and you will not be able to go back to kill your father again. Right? So logically you cannot go back to the future or go into the past. So somehow the light, uh, so somehow the law of nature must not allow this to happen. So Einstein was thinking that perhaps the idea that you can uh, apply Galilean transformation 
up to the speed of light is not true. Okay. If it's not true, then it will be very counterintuitive. Imagine that you have uh, something which is moving and you try to move fast and faster. Uh, even though you move fast and faster, that the other thing will still do not look to be slowing down. And this is very counterintuitive. Right. So that actually happens to the speed of light. So therefore, uh, to resolve the, the what do you call this, uh, it's not inconsistency, but this is called the, as a name for these kind of situations. To resolve this kind of, not dilemma. That's paradox. The, paradox, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> to resolve this kind of paradox, then you have to um, impose uh, this uh, assumption that light cannot be surplus. You cannot move faster than speed of light. Uh, so the light do not obey Galileo transformations. That is, when you get closer and closer to the speed of light, lights would not appear to slow down. Right. So this is the consequence of what we call constancy of the speed of light uh, proposal. Constancy of speed of light means that no matter how fast you move, in what directions you move, the speed of light will not appear to slow down or uh, speed up with respect to any observers. So this is the, uh, the starting point of Einstein when he proposed the special theory of relativity. But then he had to solve the problem. Uh, if the speed of light uh, do not obey these Galilean transformations, then you have to replace the Galilean transformations by a new transformation that applies not only in the regime where the relativity is low, but also apply to the situation where the speed is getting close to the light. Therefore, you have this Lorentz transformation. Okay, does that does mean if you are traveling, for example, like you are traveling in 0 0.9 C, it's 90% of uh, speed of light. That means that person who travel in 90% of speed of light, till C, the speed of light is C. Yes. So okay. this is counterintuitive. Right? So if you're moving like 2 meters per second, I mean 1 meter per second, then you will appear to be slowed down. Like when you be, appear to be like moving at like less. Like if you're going in the opposite direction, so let's say uh, you are moving in this direction, like 0.5 C, and light is coming in the opposite direction. So to you, light will appear to be 1.5 C. Uh, but this is not going to be correct. Uh, it's actually not allowed. So the Lorentz transformation have to reproduce these results. That is, no matter what velocity you are moving, the light will always be the same. And well, you impose a fact you impose assumption that the velocity of light always remains C. Then you can derive the Lorentz transformation itself. So there is actually a very good reason to, to, to derive Lorentz transformations. Okay. So that's this uh, story that I always like to tell. I'm not sure whether I told it already because I keep on telling the same story. <laughs> that is what? Uh, that is uh, when I was studying special relativity, then I was studying this Lorentz transformation. Have you studied Lorentz transformation already? Yes. Yes. So I was thinking, hmm, Lorentz transformation can be derived by making, going through the kind of argument like Einstein did. I think in your book, I think Crane's talks about derivation of Lorentz transformation using the sphere of light. And I forgot what, how it do, but you have all these details in the notes. Huh? So you can actually think of a light coming from a sphere. So a light comes from a for reference point and the reference point is moving at the speed of V with respect to another reference, reference frame, then the light bubble coming out from this, uh, this moving reference frame and the form of bubble. The bubble radius must always be the same because the light, of speed of light will always be the same. So based on this kind of argument, you can actually write down very simple, straightforward mathematical equation requiring that no matter what is the speed of this moving frame, the bubble that is emitted out from the reference frame, uh, from the center, must always remain a sphere, a sphere. Because light, no matter you move in this direction, that direction, that direction, always have the same speed. So by requiring this uh, kind of invariance, then you will naturally arrive at Lorentz transformation. Even though you do not know anything about uh, Lorentz transformations at all. So if you read the Lorentz transformation derivation very carefully, you find that as long as you assume speed of light is constant and is independent of the uh, speed of the observers, 
then you were able to derive Lorenz transform all by yourself. That was what I was thinking when I studied this when I was in undergraduate. And it doesn't really require to be very complicated. You can try and go back to read it for yourself. You can, you can really derive Lorentz transformation by just thinking, uh, by just thinking alone and requiring the concept of speed of light and just write down the transformation law. So I think the other day, I think maybe a few months ago, there was a kid is uh, studying in UK. Uh, I think he's like 16 years old in the boarding schools, and then he came here uh, to spend like two weeks with me. So I asked him to read this special relative transformation and tell him about that. So the, the kid seems to be getting what I'm saying. So he was trying to derive one transformation all by himself without knowing special relativity. And you can do that. So, uh, so the deductions that the special relativity uh, requires that speed of light has to be constant is following from a uh, argument that that was explained by me just now that is you must have speed to move at a speed as a constant speed of light or else you lead to all kind of uh, of controversies then you have to replace the Galilean transformation by Lorentz transformations okay. so this all can be done uh, it was actually done not by Einstein but done by Lorentz before Einstein so that's why you have this name, Lorentz Transformation. It's done by Lorentz. Lorentz, you know who is Lorentz? Lorentz. Lorentz uh, was the Holland scientist uh, who was uh, posed a lot of laws for this electromagnetism. So you see Lorentz names also in electromagnetism. So he was actually able to generalize the uh, Galilean transformation into the speed of light. So Lorentz Transformation was there before Einstein's. Uh, but somehow Einstein has the physical intuition to explain the physical relevance of the Lorentz transformation. Okay. So Lorentz was able to propose Lorentz transformation, but finally it's Einstein who actually discover special relativity. So Lorentz transformation is not special relativity, but special relativity is, is something which is more grand. But special, that Lorentz transformation is just part of it. So once you um, have Lorentz transformations equation written down. Then the next thing you do is you try to deduce the physical consequence of the Lorentz transformations. Then you find a lot of interesting things to happen. That is, if you uh, generalize Galilean transformation and arrive at Lorentz transformations, Lorentz transformation translates the uh, coordinates of space and the and the time. Then you work out the consequence. Then you find that. Uh, the Lorentz transformation actually predict that uh, space and time they are correlated to each other. Then you could give rise to two very weird phenomena called time dilation and uh, length contractions. So the length contraction and time dilation is a very direct mathematical consequence of Lorentz transformations. So this is the I think the very few cases class, classical example where physicists use mathematical formula to describe the behavior of our nature and the mathematical equations predict something which is totally new and people carry out experiments to verify the predictions. So this is the power of human intellectual intellectuality. People sit down, think about the logics and then construct the theory using the language of mathematics. Then you have a structures of mathematics, a set of equations that can predict something uh, based on the solution or structure of mathematics, right, such as Lorentz transformations. So if you study 104 well, you actually can predict the time dilation and length contraction as a consequence of Lorentz transformation. Then if you weird, then you can uh, carry out an experiment to, to verify yourself, to see whether there are such things happening or not. So it was predicted in 1905, time dilation and length contractions. Then people carry out the measurements. I think they put two watch one is placed on the ground, near to the ground, the other one is placed on the Eiffel Tower. No, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. So there was this distance which is quite far. Then they measure the time. So this is another story. This yeah, is general. Yeah, you're right. That's why I say it's a, it's a different story. But somehow the prediction of special relativity uh, was subsequently verified uh, at different degree, at different uh, time. 
uh, that people would never doubt the correctness of this time dilation and uh, line contraction. So these are all physical consequences from mathematics. So this is an example where you can have a theory that can describe our world correctly. So this was the first time people have done that. Then there was also other theories that has a similar structure. So for example, um, Dirac, uh, based on his uh, special relativity requirement, that the law of uh, quantum mechanics should be invariant um, under the uh, relativity. They call this a uh, Lorentz invariance. So he applied the Lorentz invariance into the law of quantum mechanics. Then he found out that the theory actually predicts the existence of antiparticles from the mathematical solutions of these direct equations. So people was very doubtful about that because you're predicting something totally out of nothing. Uh, there exists such kind of thing called antimatter in your equations. The solutions of the equation predict the existence of this kind of exotic uh, phenomena. But it was discovered subsequently. People have discovered antimatters based on these mathematical structures of direct equation alone. And there are many, many other such kind of uh, exercises. Like for example, the Higgs model for the elementary particles. So it's predicted that you have these particles called Higgs from standard models, predicted from nowhere. But you need these Higgs as a very integral in ingredient in the theory of standard models. So the predictions was very far back experiments. So I'm telling you all these stories just to let you know that if you really do physics, the physics actually is very powerful. If the theory is right, it has to be mathematically consistent, it has to be logical consistent, it has to fulfill certain criteria of, say for example, being mathematically elegant, it has to be like following, follows a certain set of rules of invariance, and it has to be verified by experiments. So these powerful laws would actually predict a lot of phenomena which is not uh, known to us, such as gravity, uh, such as uh, special relativity, time dilation, line contractions. Uh, so I was trying to actually tell you another thing I've been going too far. Yeah, so let's just come back to special relativity. So what I was trying to tell you, special relativity, the consequence of it is the time dilation and line contraction. Okay, there's another thing I want to tell you is, uh, is this. In order to appreciate special relativity in 104, uh, you are required to appreciate the classical law first. You learn 101, uh, 102, mostly 101, all the classical Newton's law. So you have to be good in classical physics uh, to be able to appreciate the power of classical physics. Only then you can appreciate special relativity. If you know nothing or you cannot appreciate what is classical physics, then you will not be able to appreciate special relativity so much. Okay? That is something which is something which uh, that I want to tell you. Because if you just look at classical physics itself, basically classical physics is just Newtonian physics. It was discovered by Newton, and Newton single-handedly uh, proposed the whole structures of this classical physics based on Newton theory. And it explains everything. Uh, everything that starts from a speck of dust. A speck of dust is the, one of the smallest classical objects you can think of, where the speck of dust still obey classical law of physics, F equals to M A basically. Up to very large, I think up to the whole galaxy. It's still under the governance of classical physics. So everything that you see, uh, electromagnetisms, uh, thermodynamics, all can be explained by classical physics. Um, so classical physics begins when people start to develop a sense of space and time when there was light uh, in the beginnings of the human, human civilizations. So when you exist, you imagine that you was like the, uh, what they call, you was the, 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 um, the person, uh, the lady, what's the name, uh, the first human being uh, was discovered in the in Africa. Uh, there was a movie about that. What's the movie? Yeah, uh? the Judy. The name uh, Lucy. Lucy? No, it's Lucy. Lucy. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know the movie Lucy? Uh -huh. 
Is that Lucy or not? What's the name of that movie? Yeah? Just Lucy. Oh, that Lucy. Yeah. But it's the yeah. brain, the, yeah. she can control 100% uh, of the brain. Yeah, yeah. So, she, so that was uh, Lucy. So Lucy was the first human being that ever stands up in the history that you know, was discovered as the first human being. So imagine it was Lucy. So you have a sense that can uh, uh, interact with your external world, your space and time. So since the beginning of civilizations, people live in the space and they know time is passing. So to them, space and time is just like uh, water, like sun, like uh, earth, like the um, air. It's, it's integral part of yourself. So you have a very direct experience about space and time. So over a few thousand years, people realize that space and time are like a background. You have a stage where people play all sorts of games, plays on the stage. And at the back of the stage, there is music playing. Right? So the music is the music, stage is the stage. These are two separate, absolutely different uh, entities. Just like you have the water flowing through independently from the stage. Right? So you have this river, you have earth, everything. But the water will just flow independently from the land around it. So water is like time. Space is like the stage. Uh, you know these two things very, very well. You feel it, you live in this. But you never imagine that space and time, they are any, in any way dependent on each other. So space, you, no matter how fast you go, no matter where you live, the time will just passes by and it passes at the same to everyone. Uh, you go to the new, the, the, go to the end of the world, uh, you go to the sun, you expect that there, the time will still run as usual. So um, no matter how fast you run, the time will just pass by as the usual. So to you, you always separate. Well, to human beings, time and space are always two separate entities. And this is very well written in Newton's book. So Newton's book is called the Principia of, what's that? Mathematica. Mathematica. Principia Mathematica. Okay. Principia Mathematica. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a very classical book. I never read it. But uh, if you're interested, you can try to read Principia of Mathematica. It was first written in Latin. It was, it was a book that is revered by many, but read by few. Lah. So in that book, he speaks about space and time very, very accurately, that these two things are absolutely independent of each other. They are in no way intertwined, no mixtures between these two. So that was a kind of absolute space-time uh, dichotomy uh, since the beginning of human life until 1905. So in 1905, spatial actually reveals that no space and time, they are actually, um, they are not two separate entities, but they actually form what they call a four-dimensional fabric, three plus one space-time. Space and time are not independent. They actually form a fabric called space hyphen time. Sometimes people just like space without hyphen, space and time together. So that is actually a very big uh, revolution in our understanding about the nature of space and time. This is actually not. So imagine that you have, uh, uh, you know, like they always use of this, uh, I don't know how to make this analogy, but some part of space has a component that can be transformed into uh, time, and some part of time can be transformed into space. Uh, it's like, okay, so let's say you think about a triangle, you have uh, A, B, then uh, you have this uh, type of this, which is C. So when your A is string a bit, uh, A is, B is, uh, well, A like this, B like this. Uh, so your A and B can uh, transform to each other, then the triangle will still form, but the, the, mod, the, the radius, well, the hypotenuse could change independently. So you, Imagine you have this triangle, okay, a right triangle. You have this hypotenuse. So you can change your side A, side B, but the, the, the hypotenuse remain the same. Okay, so you require the hypotenuse to be the same, but you can make A to be larger, B to be smaller. Like C squared equals to A squared plus B squared, right? This is a uh, Archimedes theorem. So you can make uh, A equals to one, B equals to one, or A make A equals to half, B equals to some other numbers, but the, the C squared remain the same. So this is what we call invariant, that is, uh, in the triangle, A and B, they can both change, but the C remain invariant. 
So the A can go into a little bit of A, go into B, or B can go a little bit into A, but the C square remains in Marin. So now imagine that A is the space and B is the time. So some part of A goes into some part of B. So this relationship is like a triangle equation that have C square equals to A square plus B square, but uh, C square equals to A square plus B square is a uh, invariant relationship that relates uh, the spatial component in the three-dimensional space. In special theory of relativity, you have this, uh, the name of this space called what? So three plus one, the space uh, is no more three-dimensional space, but it has a different name. I think I find it about the remaining space. Uh, uh, ah, yes, you're good. Minkowski space. So Minkowski space is a generalization of three-dimensional space. Then you add in one more time dimensions, so you make it into Minkowski space. So in Minkowski space, you have a c square t c square t square minus. Uh, x squared equals to invariant square. So, uh, so, so this is a generation of three-dimensional space into the Minkowski space. So, in your 104, you learn about this invari uh, interval invariance. There's a name for that invariant square. So, the invariant square it plays a role of this invariant of c square in the three-dimensional in the two the three by three-dimensional uh, triangles. So your Delta T square can change a little bit. Uh, your delta X square can change a little bit, but the intervals uh, invariant square will remain the same. So the invariance there serve as an invariant, where your time can go into, into a little bit of space, or space can go into a bit of time. So that was the first time that you know that space and time, they are interchangeable to each other, and they form this fabric. Uh, so a consider of that is that when you move at the speed, at some speed which is uh, very fast, then your time actually goes slow down, and vice versa. Okay. So the time dimension and space the time dimension and space dimension is a consequence of the fact that space and time they are they form the same hybrid. Okay. So that was a um, Minkowski space. So in Minkowski space. The space and time are sort of like uh, they are mixed to each other, but uh, space and time they are sort of like flat. They are still flat. Flat. Don't know how you say space time flat. Space time flat is not meaning uh, it's flat. It's just it's a flat state. <laughs> uh, it's flat lah. It's coming across space. Uh, but then there was a nineteen zero as the year where a new physics or modern physics is born. So he produced four papers. One paper is on special relativity, another paper on anyone knows about these four papers? The ground breaking paper by Einstein nineteen zero four uh, and nineteen zero five. Uh, so special relativity, of relativity is one. The other one is on uh, Brownian motion. The other two uh, is what? What's that? Photoelectricity. Photoelectricity, yes. Three. Is that one more? I think, what was that, the, the, the fourth one? Maybe it's three only, four. Uh, the last one, the fifth one was, you know what lah, you just check out and find out what Google was saying. So, uh, I have to tell you this year because uh, that was the year where Einstein first mixed space and time into the But then there was uh, a result where you consider the velocity of speed of light is going at constants, but yes, yeah, that is that is special relativity. Uh, it's uh, two separate papers. Is it two separate papers? Okay, one is E equals mc squared. That is the results of the dynamics of the special relativity. Another one is special relativity on electromagnetics or whatever. On special relativity, another one is like E equals mc squared. Then the Brownian motion paper and photoelectricity papers. Um, so there are actually very important significance of this four paper. Well, maybe I don't talk about this, or else we will not be able to finish. So, um, so special relativity was proposed based on the assumption that the speed is flatting very close to the speed of light, and also the velocity that you're considering v that you learn in 104 is a constant; it's not changing. And then uh, all the scenario in special relativity 
uh, assuming there is no result of gravity, no gravitation, no force acting on them. So, but obviously the special relativity is not complete because in a real world, uh, there are forces, gravitational force exists on the moving object. For example, an object that moves past by a big uh, planet, if you feel the force, then the force will change the velocity. Uh, so, in order to generalize the special relativity into a more general scenario where force is taken, gravitational force is taken into account and velocity changes, uh, you need to generalize your special theory of relativity. Um, so, when was the general relativity proposed? 1915? Yes, okay. So, this gap, 1905 to 1915, is telling you a very indirect fact that Einstein is such a, such a genius. So, he knows very clearly what is the problem with special relativity and what, how to solve, what are the problems that need to be solved. He needs to generalize special relativity to take into account of gravity and uh, moving velocity. And it took it 10 years to be able to complete the choice. So that itself is a very uh, stories that you need to appreciate. Um, it's a very, very difficult problem. It took a genius 10 years, 10 years to think about it. So he has tried many different methods, many different solutions. I think if we went to German, one of his, uh, uh, his, his house where he used to live, he, people still uh, uh, call, uh, still see the hand notes that's written by him. So that the hand that notebook written by him tells the process of thinking when he tried to propose a general relativity. And people read that book and you find that it's crap because it shows how confused it is when he was in the process of trying to derive the general relativity. So all the things that he wrote down are obviously all wrong because he was involved in a very intensive thinking for 10 years. And finally he got the help from Riemann uh, who is using a differential geometry mathematics to help him to solve the mathematics of the space times in the presence of gravitational field. And he realized that the space times actually become curved if you have a source of gravity. So that is the general theory of relativity. Uh, so the mathematics required is not found in ordinary mathematics. So Einstein didn't know what the matter is. So he needs Riemann uh, to know what who is Riemann. Riemann is the one that Riemann some yeah. yeah. So he was the mathematician <laughs> that 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 derived this uh, differential geometry. So 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 it took him ten years to produce that general theory of relativity. So so um, in special relativity, even though there's no Einstein in this world. Lorenz, who first found out the Lorentz transformation, and some other guys around that time, actually was close to discovering special relativity by themselves. So you can imagine a world without Einstein. Special relativity would have been discovered sooner or later. It is not 1905, it's 1907. So special relativity is not that great. I told you in the beginning, you can just sit down and think about special relativity, derive it all by yourself. You could be the, the Einstein's yourself. <laughs> You don't believe me, but that was what I was thinking. You can derive <laughs> the, the, the Lorentz transformation. Once you have a Lorentz transformation, then you can work out the consequence all by yourself. It's just a quite a straightforward uh, uh, working. So that's not so, so great about special relativity, but general theory of relativity was solely single-handedly built by Einstein. So if it's not because of Einstein's intelligence, we wouldn't have special general theory of relativity. So relativity, general relativity was cited as one of the most important achievements of human intellectuality. It is so great that um, if it's not a Greek mind like him, we will never have solved it ourselves. So imagine a world without special, without Einstein's. We will still have special relativity, but we probably wouldn't have general theory of relativity. It's a very difficult. But you ask me what's general theory, I cannot tell you too much because general theory is normally not taught in undergraduates. It's only taught in the in the postgrad post course. Um, then you saw this movie, uh, Interstellar. 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 It's easy. <laughs> the easy one. Interstellar. Mm. So Interstellar is about the effects of general relativity. That is the time dilation and 
uh, time dilation will also happen not because of speed is getting close to supply, but it's getting close to a strong gravitational field. So that is a result predicted from general gravity, but not from special theory of relativity. So that story is talking about something which is very real. If you get close to black holes, your time slows down. Your time slows down, but not other people's times. So you won't feel any difference when you are in the near to the black holes. You will still slow, you will still feel biologically, psychologically the same. Uh, so your, your psychological clock and biological clock still run at the same rate, even though you are getting close to the black holes. But compared to a clock of another person far, far away from the black holes, like uh, his daughter on Earth, her clock does not run slow, but the father's clock runs slow. So when they come together, then the daughters is like 100, over 100 years old already. Okay? So that is a true result that has been uh, measured in 19 or something in the Eiffel Towers. So Eiffel Towers, which is higher uh, from the ground, therefore the gravity is slightly uh, smaller. Can calculate the difference in the gravity between the tip of Eiffel Tower and the ground. Do you know how to calculate that using classical physics? You can still calculate that. I, I think I was cal I calculated that when I was in form six. Right? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. The gravitational strength, oh, right? The g g g m m o r square goes to m g. So the g on the ground level and the g at the high tip level is different by something. Right? The radius is like the radius of the Earth is. Uh, 3,700 kilometer, and Eiffel Tower is don't know like, you know, like 1,300 meter or so. So you take so the gravitational field G is proportional to R square, and it's inversely proportional to R square. So the effects of the gravitational difference between Eiffel Tower's tip and the bottom is is uh, can be estimated to be I think a hundred meter divided by seven by three thousand seven hundred kilometer square. So you can imagine the order of magnitude. So it's like hundred is power minus two divided by uh, three thousand. Three thousand has three zeros. So kilometer has another three zero. It's a power six in the bottom. Up is a power two. So power two or power six is a power four. Or one over power four. One power four square again become one of power eight. So the effects or the difference between the gravitational uh, field at the top and also bottom is about the difference is about uh, one over one over ten one over ten ten power eight. That is about hundred million times bigger. Mm -hmm. So you can actually do this kind of estimations in your mind if you know g is inversely proportional to r squared. So that is the effects of gravitational change between these two and gravitational uh, gr actually predicts the differences between these two. Uh, so they found that uh, the, even though the difference in the gravitational field is like uh, 100 million weaker, the effects can still be uh, somehow measured. Uh, the sensitivity can still be measured. So they used two clock and measured and they found it. So that was the first time people show a uh, difference. And also in your satellite access, so the satellite upset is moving quite fast, so it has two effects, the relativity effects and also yeah, and also the gravitational effect, which is general relativity, general relativity, general relativity effects as well. So um, yeah, so that is a kind of uh, effects that you could estimate. So I do not know how to estimate the gravitational effect, uh, the general relativity effect, but you can actually estimate the special relativity effects, that is how much time slows down for a satellite that is moving upstairs. So you you would calculate the velocity of light, uh, velocity of the satellite as compared to the speed of light. Speed of light is 10 to the power of 8. Right. So 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meter per second. And the velocity of a satellite upstairs, do you know how much is that? It's about 10 kilometer per second. Yeah. So then you can translate 10 km per second. Uh, 10 km is 10 to the power of 4 meter. 10 power of 4 meter divided by 10 power 8 meters is a 10 power of 4. The time dilation effect is proportional to gamma, 
gamma squared. Then you can actually estimate the effects is like 10 power of minus 8 or minus 16. So the time is slowed down by that factor. So you have to make corrections to this in order for the GPS to do very well. And that was the special relativity that I can tell you. So there's a lot of story, a lot of history behind the 104 special relativity. And you only learn the special relativity, but uh, you will not learn the gravitation, the, 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 the general trail of relativity, which is the sequel to 104. But unfortunately, your 104 is only stopped at, at the last part. I don't know what. The general thing is never mentioned. There's another thing I want to tell you. It's about the twin paradox. There's a lot of misconception about twin paradox. So, what's the problem with twin paradox? I asked Dr. Yang because when we travel from, uh, let's say one of the twin is getting onto the rocket and he travels at some speed and to him, he is stationary and he is seeing uh, his twin on the earth moving away from him and uh, then we can actually uh, assume that to the twin on the rocket, his time is, uh, the twin on the earth is slower, but then the twin on the earth can also make the same assumption that the guy, uh, his twin on the rocket is slow. Yeah, exactly. So you're very good. What's the name? Isaac. Sorry? Isaac. 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 I should remember your name. You, you are very good. Okay. So Isaac uh, actually seems to read a lot, and she knows a lot, and he knows a lot. So the problem with twin paradox is not because one uh, of the twins is getting the time getting slower than the other one. This is not the problem. This is not a paradox. The paradox is that of the symmetry. So you have two para two twins is moving away from the other. So from this point of view, um, if you take this as reference, he is moving away. So he is moving faster. Therefore, his time will run slower. But if you take the viewpoint that this is stationary, but this is going away, then this would, this guy is moving and his time should run slower. So when both of them come back together, then what happened? The time is the same. No, so this is, <laughs> there, there, there yeah. must be something there. The time, so the paradox is not because time slide runs slow. Time runs slow is not a paradox. The paradox is symmetry. There seems to be a symmetry between the two twins so you cannot solve this problem using special relativity alone. So the twin paradox is not to justify the correctness of special relativity. On the other hand, the twin paradox actually just tells you that special relativity is not complete. That was the time, that was the reason why Einstein was starting to think of general relativity. So when he proposed special relativity, then he already know about this twin paradox. So he coined this twin paradox because he has a theory of special relativity. He knows very well because he proposed it. But then at the same time, he also he proposed this paradox. This paradox seems to be inconsistent with the special theory of relativity. There is a symmetry between these two, and as long as there's a symmetry between these two, then you will lead to this paradox. Paradox means that either way, you will not be correct. So twin paradox is an indication that special theory of relativity is incomplete. That prompts him to think, to spend 10 years to come up with a general theory of relativity. So the idea here is actually there is actually not a symmetry between these two. So if you assume symmetry between the two uh, twins, then the paradox exists. But if you bring in gravitational field, then the symmetry is broken. That would escape from the paradox. So how is that happen? So when the twins is moving away, one of the twins is moving away, so the twin, it undergoes an acceleration and it does not feel the gravitational force. The other twins on Earth does not feel the acceleration and feel the gravitational pull. So the gravitational field and accelerations, they're actually the same thing. Gravitational field uh, and acceleration has exactly the same effects. So that is, it is this gravitational field and acceleration that breaks the symmetry between them. Therefore, in order to solve the general, the, the, the twin paradox, you have to introduce the gravity. So when gravity is introduced, then the twin paradox is no more paradox because indeed you can do a calculation to show that um, the person who is running away undergo the space travel, his time is different than the one on the Earth one. 
So you can actually plot you know how they how they do the calculation. I think you plot the space time diagram. You plot the space time diagram. I think you plot the space versus time for a person who is living. So you have space times plot. Uh, the forty five degree plot refers to the speed of light. So you always move uh, less than speed of light. Therefore, you are always in one region. And if you could never overtake the forty five degree regions to go to another uh, regions. So everyone who is moving in this world has to move in this light cone in the space time. So you draw two light, two space light, two space time diagram, one for the person on Earth, one for the person on gravity. So from the trace of this space time diagram, you can trace out a history of motions and the history or the shape of the space time diagram for a person uh, reflects its history and also reflects its experience with gravity. So a person with gravity, a person without gravity, they have different shapes. Of the curvature, I think you look at the curvature, you can know whether that person undergoes the gravity or not. Uh, that person undergoes special um, uh, acceleration or not. So if you compare the two space time uh, curve on these twins, uh, starts from zero zero, then come back and meet again. On the, then from the curve, from the history of the track of this curvature, you can deduce the time spent by the curvature A and the curvature B. Then you deduce the time indeed is uh, shorter for one and then longer for another. So the general relativity is a result from Einstein's uh, twin paradox. So Einstein is very good in his thinking. He invented this um, Galactic experiment. So twin paradox is one of those experiments. Uh, he, he used his mind and logical uh, tricks to understand the nature. So twin paradox. Uh, Problems him to think how to solve the general special relativity, uh, the twin paradox, and life at general general relativity. The person who is looking in the mirror, traveling at the speed of light in the space, in the rocket, also prompts him to think of this special relativity. And then he's also another very famous paradox it's called EPR paradox. Have you heard about this EPR paradox, which is nothing to do with special relativity? EPR stands for Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox. It was written much later in this. So we were saying that if you have a atoms and then you have two photons coming out from the atoms and these photons are coming from the same origins. So these photons who are coming from the same origin, uh, they are governed by quantum mechanics in the source of the atom. So these two uh, photons, when they are born out from the same source and they are made to move in the opposite directions, one go this, one go that, and I think they are separate far, far away. And due to quantum mechanical effects, the two are somehow correlated. So if you uh, make one of the light uh, photon in this end of the universe to be detected in up, then the other photon in another end of the universe will automatically shoot down. Yeah, something like this. So according to special theory of relativity, the information has to be passed from one point to another before well, that is the, the gist of the special relativity. Information cannot be sent from one point to another. Um, faster than light. But in the EPR paradox case, the two photons are separated far, far away. And, uh, but immediately what happens to here will be known by the other photon immediately. So this is obviously violating the special theory of relativity. So he was proposing this uh, as a challenge to quantum mechanics. Say quantum mechanics must be incorrect because special relativity has to be always be observed. But quantum mechanics seems to break the speed of light uh, theorems. Therefore, he challenged the quantum mechanics people to solve this problem of P E B R paradox. And you know what happened? Who wins? So. Um, I think 1970s, 1960s, people start to carry out experiments to measure whether you can see this quantum paradox, uh, DRPR paradox, EPR pair. They create experimentally a pair that come from the same origins, separately far, far away. Normally, what they do is uh, they create a pair mm -hmm. of make the photons to run in fiber optics, so that fiber optics you can you can make the photon to go into fiber optics, and you you make the fiber optics to be very, very long so that you can put them in the lab. So you curl as many fiber optics possible. Then you send for photon beam into this fiber optics. One goes to one goes to this like this uh, beam. Uh, one photon 
goes into this direction, the other over to another direction. You don't go separate, but you go, you use the, the fiber optics as to replace the distance travel. So they separate the fiber optics very far, far away. They find that actually there is this EPR paradox happening. So we call this the entanglement, fundamental entanglement. And it's found that fundamental entanglement actually exists. And then Einstein seems to be losing. <laughs> That, but I think still people think that uh, he, he still insists that quantum mechanics is, is incomplete. It doesn't say it's incorrect, but say it's complete. It's incomplete. So the world is still deterministic. We can still explain this quantum entanglement, uh, not within quantum mechanics itself, but something is still missing called hidden variables in quantum mechanics. So that's uh, another story reserved for another talk. <laughs> okay, so that is the story that I want to tell you. I want to. Uh, make you aware of the history of what you all learned in your 104. There's a lot of things I can talk about. I, when I was in 104, I, I, I told, tell a lot of stories. People love to hear my story. But then finally, we do not have enough time to finish the syllabus. <laughs> <laughs> so if you study your physics, and if you take efforts to discover the, the, the stories, and try to think of all the other, other relevant matters, it makes your study much, much more interesting. It's not actually very boring. It's not a formula E equals mc square, and this formula gamma equals 1 over square root of 1 minus b square over c square. That, that is actually the boring way to learn <laughs> physics. There's a lot of things that is very interesting in special relativity. Not only special relativity, but in, say, quantum mechanics, in modern physics, in uh, Frankfurt's experiment, uh, in, I don't know what, what you learn in 104, you learn this Frankfurt's experiment, you learn about uh, Planck's theory, uh, Planck's, uh, Planck's theory of black body radiations. You learn also other stuff like the like the ball flex deflections. You learn about all these other experiments. These are all very interesting stories behind it. Okay, the content scattering. These are all Nobel Prize experiments. They all have stories behind it. Okay, so that is what I want to tell you. So we can open for discussions. Uh, okay. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone want to have something? But where does the Einstein, uh, the special relativity second postulate that the speed of light is mm -hmm. deep for all observers? Mm -hmm. And why is, uh, where is the proof that the speed is the limit for speed? It's a very good question. You were asked the same questions. Mm -hmm. right. So in the beginning, that because that is definitely violating all common sense. So you don't have the apparatus to see what happens when things go down to the scale of say one one micron or one uh, femtometer or one tenth of femtometer. What you can imagine is that you based on your physical experience or what you see in the in the microscopic world. Then you extrapolate your imagination into the microscopic world and imagine that in that microscopic world, things and physical laws still exist. So that happens to uh, Galilean transformations. You always think that uh, when you move to the speed of light, uh, Galilean transformation still persists. That is a direct projection of your feeling beyond the limitations of our senses. And in many cases, such a uh, extrapolation proven wrong. Uh, people never go beyond the Earth to go to other, other, other planets. So in the olden days, you never leave the Earth. So you can just imagine uh, the Sun is like Earth, but actually it's not. Right? So you have to resort to science uh, where you use logical deductions, you use mathematics as a tool to extend your expectation, your your senses. You have to use. Um, uh, apparatus to expand your senses. If you use just your physical intuitions, then you normally will be going wrong. Now I haven't answered your question yet. Yes. So imagine you were Einstein's. How do you solve the problem? Then you start to think along the directions. So you think of this possibility, that possibility. I, I am quite sure Einstein had been thinking all possibilities to come up to solve this problem. What happens? when you are serving at the speed of light. And what is the consequence of that? And how do you break away from, from the paradox that result from the fact that you can pass through the speed of light or moving at the speed of light? 
So I think the very, very uh, common, uh, the very logical uh, process of thinking will lead to the fact that if you assume the speed of light is constant, then you solve all the problems. So that is a very uh, logical arrival, a logical consequence that you arrive at. Imagine if Einstein, I think you will some com you will also arrive at the same, same same conclusion. So, but then when you arrive at the same conclusion, you ask, where is the where is the uh, exper experiments that prove this? Where is this uh, assumption come from? Where is it coming from? How could you say that it's true? Uh, that is a very good question. So. experiment that I think uh, I cannot get uh, related to the speed of light but one of it is the Michelson only experiment they disprove the existence of ether and second one is uh, I haven't learned yet but I read up on the internet they said that the Maxwell equation and some of it I, I don't know because I never mm -hmm. learned it yet they said that from that Maxwell equation they can show that the limit for speed is speed of light? Uh, the, I answer that as a second part first. The Maxwell equation actually so costly, the Maxwell equation is so complete, so beautiful, that indeed it is consistent with the speed of light. It's, co it's consistent with special activity. So after special activity has been uh, proven to be correct, you do not need to rewrite Maxwell equation. Special, Maxwell equation is what we call naturally uh, Special is is naturally Lorentz invariant by construct, but it's not like normal. It's not like other physical law. Other physical law, when they found res special relativity effect, they normally have to rewrite the law to accommodate the Lorentz invariance. So Maxwell equation does not need to be rewritten, but Maxwell equation remain correct whether the speed of consistency of speed of light uh, is true or not. I think that is that that is the correct statement. Special relativity uh, do not affect. Maxwell equation. Uh, what well, should I say is, uh, even though the speed of light is not c, the Maxwell equation will not uh, be incorrect as well. Okay, so, so you don't. Uh, so, the other one is uh, the the, the Maxwell model. So I haven't talked about Maxwell model experiments. Maxwell model experiments. It doesn't say the speed of light is constant. It doesn't say that. There's many misconceptions about the Maxwell model experiment. I guess one experiment just says this. It says this. as far as experimental limit is concerned, they find that the uh, velocity of speed of light uh, do not change uh, to do not change. Well, even though the experiment, even though light change in the speed of the moving object, the experiments of that uh, Michael one experiment does not detect that. So it actually give a, a, a limit for 10 power minus 8 defects. If the speed of light changed by that amount, the experiment would not be have detect, detected. So the Maxwell experiment only show, uh, I think, a lower limit, upper limit, uh, that speed of light, if it changed, then it would not be detected. So it doesn't show absolutely that speed of light does not change. So Maxwell experiment just trying to, to, to test whether the light obeys Galilean transformation or not. If they obey Galilean transformation, they would have detected it. If the change is falling within the sensitivity of the experiment, the Maxwell experiment has a very high sensitivity as tau minus eight. Um, so, so if the Galilean transformations causes that light to change by that amount, it will be detected. But they say, okay, we detect nothing. So it's a negative experiment. So that is a Nobel Prize given to experiment that prove nothing. Yeah, it's very to prove the ex to prove the absence of something can be as important as prove the existence of something. It is the proof of the in ex uh, is proof the absence of the effect. So that is to happen. So come back to these uh, questions. Um, so the microscope experiment only partially but not directly, only partially and indirectly uh, consistent with the fact that speed of light uh, is invariant. But it's not a direct proof, it's just a supporting proof. So when I said propose that idea that speed of light has to be constant. Uh, I think that time there's no experimental evidence for that. It's a it's it's a it's a very natural logical assumption that he will make. If I were to do that I would do the same assumptions. So you can do this to other theories as well. So you look at something then you try to explain something, you try to do your own theory. 
So you sit and think and think and think. Okay, then you come up with some proposal. I assume that this is true, this is true, this is true. Then I'll, I'll proceed to work out the consequence of this assumption. So this is what I think the, he assumes seed of light is constant. He assumes the law of seed of That is, no matter how fast you move, in the frames of your, uh, in your moving frames, with respect to the stationary frames, your law of physics must be invariant. So he used these two assumptions, which is very, very general assumptions. Then he worked out the consequence. So this is the way how physics is done. You assume something, then you work out a consequence on that. So normally people assume some kind of mathematical symmetry that the law has to obey this kind of symmetry. Invariance is a symmetry. So the Lorentz invariance is a symmetry. That is, the law of physics must remain the same in different in a moving frames, in any 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 any, in any initial frames. So that is a mathematical requirement. We call it Lorentz invariance. It amounts to saying that the law of physics uh, should be the same in all initial frames. And then we also further assume light of speed of light is constant. So you make this assumption, then you are the consequence. Then you let the nature to tell you whether your consequence is consistent with observation or not. So you do a prediction and let nature decide. So this is science. You would not say this is true because I say so, but you propose something, then law of nature will verify your statements or will falsify your statements. Uh, so that is something which is nice, it's very objective. So people propose different types of theory, different types of predictions, trivial, non trivial. Like for example, the Higgs model, the Higgs particles is predicted. It's very highly non trivial predictions uh, and it's proven to be correct. People are going to verify for that. There are also people trying to prove using the same tricks. They say, for example, the space time has 11 dimensions. No, it says that uh, we don't have only four uh, dimensions, three plus one, we have extra dimension. So we have this extra dimension, the fourth one. The fourth one dimension is not small, but it's very large. We call it as large as, uh, as experimental can detect. We call this extra large dimensions. So in the, 19, in the end of 1990s and beginning of 1920, year 2000. So this is popular. Because people think it is possible that theory can create a situation where our nature uh, Accommodate and large extra dimension. Large here means at the sub millimeter scale. Uh, the large dimension is, 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 is as small as a sub millimeter, 0 0.01 millimeter, and it can be detected experimentally. And theoretically, you can construct such a model. So it follows all the tricks that was done by Einstein. Einstein, he sit down, use his logical mind, write down the equations, demand the invariance law. Uh, and then make sure that everything is logically consistent and logically making sense. And then you follow all these uh, other things and physics as well. Then you have a nice theory that can predict something that may be justified by experiments. So there's this extra dimension people also do the same thing. And so they predict and then they write down equations, very nice equation, and all the predictions is not violating any observations. So it's a sound and uh, 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 like legal scientific thing that makes some extra that prediction that is if it's found true would revolutionize our understanding. Of nature has an extra dimension, hidden dimensions which is not seen by us directly. So if somehow we can enter an extra dimension, then you just got missing. So it's something which is very great, but unfortunately, nature find no such like signatures. So you can have a situation where you have very nice, beautiful theory, but experimentally you just cannot find a signature. Superstring is another, supersymmetry is another, and there are many other extra, uh, many many theories of similar sort. Very beautiful, very elegant, legitimate theories and models, which is not correct. Okay. So you would make assumptions, and you do not know whether this is true or not. You just make assumptions, but you let the nature to decide. So this is kind of method that scientists will do. You would justify a statement by the consequence of it. So I make statements. If my statement is wrong, then uh, people will prove me wrong. But if I make a statement, and finally the statement is all supported by all the consequences, which is all correct, that means my statement is correct. 
right? So sometimes people ask me, how do you know it's wrong? How do you know it's right? I don't, I don't know. I just do it, and then I'll know over time. The evidence will tell me, will help me whether mine is wrong or right. So for scientists, you don't scared of making mistakes. You just do not know. You're just uncertain about your theories. But people are, scientists are actually very brave. They know the tricks. They, they, would, they would be brave to handle this kind of uncertainty to their theories. They just proceed, and then they see what happens to the consequence. If something is wrong, then they will adjust and then try to explain the way or refine the theories until it got done. So we we'll have to learn how to handle uncertainty in making scientific progress. So here, naturally, we don't nurture this kind of um, attitude. We have to be sure if A is A, it's not B. So you give A as a wrong answer, then you deduct your mark. So as a consequence, people don't dare it's to care. make mistakes. Yeah. It's care to make mistakes. So this is no good. Science uh, physicists are supposed to be trained to handle uncertainty. You learn how to handle uncertainty. If it's wrong, you know how to handle it and change it and make it corrections. So this is the way how science should be done. I mean, yeah. So that's actually. <laughs> oh, okay. So actually, we are already out of time. But maybe we can continue in the said, future talk. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> we will call you again. Don't worry. So as a conclusion, can you make a conclusion for to the topics? I I made a conclusion that I I I I spoke I have spoken too much. <laughs> I was supposed to tell you a little bit. Then you 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 tell me a lot of questions. Then I can answer in your questions. But it turned out that I, I got involved in my own speech and then <laughs> uh, so, so the conclusion is uh, that the 104 special deity is something which is not very deep, not that very but there's nothing special about it. You know, everyone can read and learn and score it. But what I want you to appreciate is the idea, the developments of the idea of specialty, how you go through the experience of uh, understand the theory. You, I, I always say this, you always imagine you are Einstein. You were Einstein in that kind of time. How do you monitor your progress of thinking to arrive at the theory? So that thinking process is something which is most important. It's not the final theory because you can just learn the theory in the next. It's a process of thinking. You learn how to think like a physicist. That is my conclusion. Okay. That's all. Okay, so thank you everyone. <laughs> and thank you for coming. So next week we will proceed with another topic and we will publish it in the page. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. So I must have said a lot of long things, so I got recorded. <laughs>